everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today on this topic. It's always kind of inspiring to know that people are interested and care about a topic like this. Because, you know, if you follow the media even just a little bit, you know that most of the news that we see about gender diversity is bad. We know that women are underrepresented in leadership roles, we know they're paid less than men, and they suffer harassment at work. The headlines we see come from all over the world, they're international. You have your share of negative headlines here in Ireland. I see plenty of them in Australia. Uh, the one that I brought to show you here is an annual favorite. Uh, every year we hear that we have more male leaders with a particular name than we have female leaders by any name. Uh, this year the name of choice is Andrew. We have more male CEOs named Andrew in Australia than we have female CEOs. So it's sort of a downer. Now you would think that with all this media exposure, with all of this press, we would have a sense of urgency that businesses would say, we got to start working on this, we got to solve this problem, and it would be very easy to get that kind of engagement. But in my work, I often find exactly the opposite. I feel like we've heard so much about this problem that we're exhausted by it, that it's actually hard to generate energy about it. When I talk to managers, they say, oh, you know, in my organization, we've already got gender fatigue. Uh, the women in our organization, they're mentored to death. So it's actually kind of hard to get traction. And I know that a lot of you work in HR roles, and my guess is you know that feeling from your own organizations, right? It's hard to keep gender diversity issues on the boil. And that's really a shame. Because what we know is that gender diversity, particularly gender diversity in leadership roles, makes organizations better. Uh, we know that organizations that have more gender diversity in leadership makes organizations better for employees because those organizations offer more diversity management practices. They invite more employee participation. We know that organizations with more gender diversity in leadership roles makes organizations better for their communities. Uh, they engage in more social responsibility. They engage in more philanthropy. We know that organizations with more gender diversity in leadership roles also benefit customers because they generate more innovative products and services. So honestly, you know, I'm thinking, what's not to like here? This is a pretty good thing. But I think there's a couple of caveats that I need to be clear about right from the beginning. First of all, you notice that when I was talking just now, I was very careful to say more gender diversity in leadership roles. I didn't say female leaders make organizations better. I didn't say that women are better leaders than men. Um, there's plenty of diversity within both the male and female leadership pools. We have good male leaders, we have good female leaders, and we have plenty of bad examples of both. But what really generates these effects is that when you have a decision-making body, and within that body when you have visible indicators of diversity, and gender is nice and visible, it's very obvious, members of that body anticipate that there are also invisible and hidden forms of diversity. They expect that these people who look different also have different experiences, have different kinds of values. And so that visible diversity really motivates the group to dig a little deeper, to think about more different strategies, and as a result, they end up making better decisions. The other thing that I should be really, you know, upfront about is that my little wall of fame here didn't include financial performance. Now, probably most of you have seen these industry reports that say more gender diversity means that organizations are going to be more profitable, they're going to make more money. Now, the academic literature on that is a little more nuanced. It's absolutely true that greater amounts of gender diversity in leadership show a positive association with organizational financial performance. But honestly, that association is pretty small. There's probably a lot of things you could do to improve your organization's financial performance that would have a bigger oomph than just generating more gender diversity. 
And it's also really important to remember that organizations tend to increase gender diversity when they're in the most financially unstable and precarious situations. It's those situations where organizations are most motivated to make a change in leadership, and that's when women are most likely to step in. So okay, if you want these benefits, one of the things you gotta try and do is get more gender diversity into leadership roles. So what we're about today is to figure out how do we get there from here. Now I promise today to talk about three things, pressures, practices, and pipelines, but I'm pretty sure I can throw in a couple of bonus words that also begin with P. So let's start with pressures. You know, stakeholders read the same headlines that we do, and our stakeholders are getting impatient. We've been waiting for some action here for a long time. And so one of the things that I think we're seeing in today's environment is much more external pressure on organizations. Some of that pressure comes directly from government, where governments are passing laws and bills to try and improve gender diversity. Some of it is coming from other organized groups. Now, let me set the stage. The data I'm going to be talking about comes from Australia, where I live and work, but honestly it has implications for the entire world. Any place where we have gender diversity being lower than we'd like it to be, and where we're using some of these external pressures to move it along. What I'm about to show you is the data from Australia about women on boards in the ASX 200. So these are the 200 largest organizations in Australia. What we saw for a long time was a representation of about 8%. This number was very stable for many, many years. And then the ASX Corporate Governance Council announced that they were going to lay out new reporting requirements on listed organizations. These were not quotas. Uh, what they encouraged organizations to do was to set their own targets. But organizations were required to report on gender diversity on their boards and in their executive management teams in their annual reports. So it was a lot more of a transparency kind of system. And almost immediately, we saw a dramatic increase in appointments of women to corporate boards. And we saw a parallel increase in appointments of women to executive groups. There was this big spurt of activity. But it didn't take very long before it started to level off. And we started to hear things like one and done, two and through. And we saw organizations increasing gender diversity on their boards by making the boards bigger. So that they could say, oh yeah, you know, we've got a woman or two on our boards, but because the board had been grown, the proportion actually stayed very, very small. So I think you can already see both the value and the limitation of external pressures to solve this problem. The value is that it can generate activity, it can create a burst, but I think in the face of external pressures, you often see organizations playing to the lowest common denominator. They'll make sure they're not the worst performer, but there's not a lot of motivation or incentive to get them to leap ahead. Now, more recently, we've gotten another burst from the Australian Institute of Company Directors, uh, which announced a target of 30% women on boards by the end of this calendar year. Now, are we going to achieve that? Mm, not entirely clear. Right now, we're hovering at about 28%. Now, how does this compare to Ireland? Um, currently in Ireland, you have about 16% women on boards. And you've got groups like the 30% Club who are similarly encouraging 30% as a target. So right now you're sitting about where Australia was maybe three years ago. So the trajectory may be very similar. So I always think that when you look at this graph, it's a really good test as to whether you are an optimist or a pessimist. Um, if you're an optimist, you look at this and you say, wow, look at that tremendous growth in the last 10 years, decades of no progress, and suddenly here, you know, there's been this dramatic burst. But if you're a pessimist, you say, golly, we're still not at parity. Golly, we're not even at the 30% target. 
And if you look deeper, if you look behind the ASX 200 and you look at the smaller organizations, you know that the numbers are way, way less than this. So is this going to be sustainable? I don't know. But this is what I can say for sure. When your business is operating in a context where there are these external pressures, the effectiveness of your management practices, the things that you're already doing around gender diversity, the effectiveness of those practices are going to change, both as a function of the pressures themselves and of the gender diversity that they generate. Now I'll come back to, to pressures in a moment, but I want to take a little detour now and talk about practices. So if you asked anybody on the street, what's the answer? How are we going to get more gender diversity into leadership roles? Probably what they would say is workplace flexibility. So if there's anything that people agree on, whether you're talking about policy makers or business leaders or trade unions, they would say really what we need is for organizations to be more flexible because we know that women carry an extra burden. Women are more likely to be responsible for caring in the home. They're more responsible for children. And if organizations only recognize that and could be a little bit more flexible so women could accommodate these dual responsibilities, they'd be more likely to stay in organizations and they'd be more likely to get promoted. So that's a really important idea, right? Uh, we need to know if that's going to work. So we wanted to take a look at that and see if workplace flexibility would really increase the proportion of women in leadership roles. Now in Australia, organizations who have more than 100 employees are required to report every year to the WGEA, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And what they have to file in these reports is information both about women in management roles, and this is management treated very broadly, not just the most senior roles, uh, but they're also required to report on the kind of practices that they have that are designed to improve gender diversity. So what we did in this research is we went back to the oldest reports that we could get our hands on. And these were reports that were filed from 2002 to 2006. And we went through these reports and simply counted the number of workplace flexibility practices that organizations were adopting. These were things like uh, offering employees opportunities to take um, leave for caring responsibilities, uh, opportunities to have flexible work schedules, uh, opportunities to take advantage of on-site childcare services, opportunities to work from home. So a wide variety of flexible work opportunities. And what we wanted to know was, if your organization had invested in these kinds of practices back in 2002 to 2006, were you going to see more women in management in your organization a few years down the track? Now, it's really important that there's a lag, right? You're not going to see these things make a difference right away, because the women who are taking advantage of these flexible practices today tend to be more at early stages of their career, and it's going to take a while before they get into a position where they might even be eligible for management roles. So what we did was we compared organizations who had invested heavily in these practices back in 2002, and we compared them against organizations that hadn't made that investment. And we looked to see if they had different levels of women in management in 2010. And the answer was no. They had exactly the same proportion of women in management in 2010. Didn't make any difference whether they had made these investments in flexible work. So we thought, well, OK, um, maybe we just haven't waited long enough. Maybe 2010 wasn't the right time. So we looked at women in management rates in 2012. And you can see there's just the tiniest little smidgen of difference where organizations who had invested in work flexibility practices back in 2002 were starting to see some benefit. But that difference that you're seeing there is not statistically significant. As an academic, I can't sell it to you. But when you look at 2014 women in management rates, that's where we first start to see a significant difference. If your organization had started investing in work flexibility practices back in 2002, 
in 2014, 12 years later, you were achieving 3% more women in management than your competitors who hadn't made that investment. Well, you know, I feel okay about 3%. 3% counts, that matters. Uh, but 12%, 12, 12 years, that's a pretty long time to wait. Uh, organizations have to be pretty patient if they think this is going to be the key. And again, I think about all of you who are in HR roles, and I picture you going into your CEO's office and saying flexibility is the key, but you're probably not going to see the benefit for 12 years. Yeah, that's, that's a tough sell. So I think it's really important that we think about some alternatives, and particularly things that might move the dial a little bit faster. So let's go on to talk about pipelines. Things like flexible work practices focus on the bottom of the pipeline. These are bottom off efforts. They are things that are designed to push talent up the pipeline. And I think most of the things that we do in organizations and most of the things that we study as academics are these kind of bottom up efforts. They're things that focus at the bottom of the pipeline. You know, I told you that man managers tell me that their women are mentored to death. And in some ways, they're right. Uh, because every time we have an idea for a new initiative that's going to make a difference, it's these women that we focus on. It's the women who are at the early stages of their management careers. But what I'd like to suggest to you is that there might be another way. What if instead of focusing on the bottom of the pipeline, what if we focus nearer the top? I want to talk to you about top-down efforts that focus more at higher levels of the pipeline, that rather than trying to push talent up, they're more about pulling talent up. So it's a slightly different model. What I want to tell you about is the trickle-down effect. The data that I'm going to show you come from ASX-listed organizations over a 10-year period. And what we were looking at here was to see if the proportion of women on boards would predict the proportion of women in executive teams a year later. So if you have lots of women in these very senior roles, does that influence how much diversity you see the following year a level down? And the answer is yes, there's a very strong positive effect. Now, I just told you these are data from boards predicting gender diversity at the executive group, but I can tell you this pattern holds no matter what two levels you're looking at in the organization. We see the same pattern if you say, gee, if I have gender diversity in my executive group, am I going to get gender diversity in the executive feeder positions? Yes. Uh, we see the same pattern in public sector departments. We see the same pattern in private sector organizations. So it's, it's quite powerful and quite robust. The trickle-down effect comes through two mechanisms. One mechanism is about active advocacy and mentoring. So these women who you have in these very senior roles, uh, they may be very active in using their networks to encourage other women to apply to your organization when management roles become available. They may be very active in mentoring junior women to make sure that they are promotable as opportunities open up. So the senior women may actually be doing things that change the organization. But it's not necessary. Let's suppose that these most senior women did nothing they just did their jobs. You would still see a trickle-down effect because of the other mechanism, which is a very passive signaling mechanism. When an organization has senior women, has a cohort of senior women at, at the very top, it sends a very strong signal out to the market. It says, this is an organization that takes this gender stuff seriously. Look, even in our most senior roles, we've got a cohort. And that motivates women out in the market to apply to your organization. So now you have a better pool of talent to choose from. It's a lot easier to get gender diversity. Uh, the other place where it sends a signal is within your own organization. 
We know that women in general are less likely to put themselves up for promotion compared to men. They're less likely to self-nominate. But in this kind of organization where you can see women in the most senior roles, you're more likely to think, oh, you know, it's possible. This is a place where gender works. So both of these things contribute to a trickle-down effect. Now, I think the trickle-down effect is so important and represents kind of an untested avenue for us um, that I'm going to ask you to kind of stick with me and let me walk you through a very specific example. Now, in Australia, most corporate boards range between 8 and 12 members. The example that I'm giving you has a 10-person board of directors, and that's just to make the math easier. It means that every director represents 10% of this board. Now, in our data, on this 10-person per ten board, let's suppose that the typical organization has all men. So it's a board made up exclusively of male directors. What we found in our data set is that this organization, with zero diversity on its board, had about 10% women in its executive group. And what we wanted to know is what happens as you put more women onto this board. When this organization appoints the first woman to the board, it created a 4% increase in gender representation in the executive group a year later. So create diversity here, you get a little more diversity there. Now let's suppose that the next year, this organization puts a second woman on the board. At this point, what the organization experiences is a 9% increase in female executive representation above that 10% that it started with. Now there was just a little piece of magic that happened here and I wanna make sure that you saw it. When I put the first woman on this board, she generated a 4% increase in executive representation. If every female board appointment generated a 4% increase, that number should be 8%, right? 4% plus 4%, but it's 9%. It's actually a little bit more. The second appointment that you make gives you a little more oomph. It generates a little bit more diversity in the level below. The signal has gotten a little bit stronger because of the second appointment. The trickle-down effect is not linear, but it's incremental. And so as a result, when you appoint the third woman on that board, she generates a larger increase than the woman who came before her. So here's what I think is kind of interesting. Um, this is a system where the organization in three years, as a result of increasing diversity on its board, generated a quite large increase in diversity in its executive team. And it took three years to do that. But if this organization had instead appointed a cohort of three women to its board, it would have gotten that 16% increase in a single year. Now, compare those two effects, right? I just told you that if you really invest heavily in flexible work practices, in 12 years you might get 3% more women in management. And here I'm telling you, if you focus on diversity at the highest levels, you can generate 16% increases in those senior levels in a single year. Uh, to me, that's not such a tough call, right? It suggests that we really need to be focusing at the top of the organization. And it also suggests how important it is that we be thinking about cohorts, not about appointing the first woman or even the second woman, but about making sure that there is enough gender diversity in those senior roles. But wait, there's more. So I've kind of presented this as though you have a choice, right? You can either focus at the bottom of the pipeline and invest in things like flexible work practices, or you can focus on the top of the pipeline and try and create this trickle-down effect. But in fact, what works best is if your organization was working both ends. Because what we find is that the practices that you already have in place to improve gender diversity are a lot more effective if you already have some gender diversity in your organization. 
So earlier I showed you this data that we have on flexible work practices. I told you that you could get a 3% increase eventually if you're patient enough. Um, but what we found is that that was just an average. It really makes a difference how many women you already have in the organization. Organizations that invested heavily in work-life practices but didn't have a lot of gender diversity in the organization. Work practices, flexibility practices did not improve women in management rates. In fact, it lowered them. Because in organizations where you don't have a lot of gender diversity, if you're offering flexible work practices, you're creating exceptions. The few women who are taking advantage of these practices are quite unusual. They're inconvenient. They might be stigmatized as a result of taking advantage of those practices. So the practices never become really normalized. But we found that in organizations that already had high levels of gender diversity, when they offered flexible work practices, they worked a lot better. And in fact, these organizations were able to generate 6% more women in management roles as a result of having those practices in place. So you can see we have a chicken and egg problem. Uh, we know the things that might improve gender diversity in management roles, uh, but we also know that the effectiveness of those practices really depends on how much gender diversity you have. So we really need to be thinking about how we can generate boosts in gender, gender diversity in order for the practices themselves to work. So let's talk about another P word. Um, let's talk about the pay gap. These are Australian data. Again, they come from the WGEA, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Um, last year, the WGEA told us that the average pay gap in Australian organizations was about 17%. Um, Friday, when I was on my way here, the WGEA announced the latest numbers, and the pay gap in Australia right now is 15%, so a slight improvement. In Australia, pay gap is about 14%, so we're in kind of that same basket. But it's really important to remember that the pay gap that we usually talk about is just for base salary. And if you start thinking about some of the more discretionary parts of salary, things like incentives or bonuses, the pay gap actually is quite a bit bigger. In Australia, for example, it tends to hover around 20%. Now, I told you that one of the things that happened when Australia started having these external pressures, when we started having these corporate governance requirements, um, we saw organizations appoint a lot more women to boards and to executive roles. And we were really wondering about those executive women, these ones who suddenly were getting more job opportunities than they had had before. Were they going to experience a pay gap? And you might be very skeptical about that. You might say, wait a minute, these are the most senior women. These are women at the peak of their career. And these are women in a country where there is tremendous pressure to appoint women to senior roles. So they know their value. They know what they're worth. They know how to negotiate. So we looked at more than 3,000 executives working in ASX 500 firms over five years. And we looked specifically for a pay gap in salary and in incentives, so in the, the basic pay and also in the discretionary part. And what we found was that there's a 20% pay gap, even at these levels. So again, I think we have to think hard about the limitations of external pressures. External pressures focus organizations' attention on one specific part of the problem. If the pressures say that the problem is representation, organizations will respond to that. But it doesn't do us any good if we solve the representation problem while creating another problem, which is inequity in pay. So it just goes to show how systemic gender inequity issues are. But remember, I also told you that gender diversity in leadership roles makes organizations better. And here's another example of that. When we looked at the pay gap for these executives, we found that the gap was dramatically larger 
in organizations that didn't have women on their corporate boards. The pay gap was like 40 and 50 percent, whopping, absolutely huge. When organizations have women on their boards, one of the things that happens is the board starts monitoring other kinds of gender inequities. And so these things are more likely to come to light and they're more likely to be addressed earlier. So it's really important to remember that as we respond to external pressures, we have to keep monitoring the system. We have to make sure that we're addressing inequity in all of its forms. So let me go back one last time to this idea of pressures. I showed you this graph earlier. I told you that one of the really wonderful things about making appointments at senior levels is they will generate more diversity within the organization and that this comes as a result of a signaling effect. What I didn't tell you earlier is that these data, this graph, comes from 2006. So it comes from a few years before Australia saw these external pressures about gender representation. The trickle-down effect at that time was very strong. This is the line from 2012. This is the line that results a few years after corporate reporting was required on gender equity. What happens when you have stakeholder pressure to improve gender representation. The things that you're doing in your organization aren't given as much credit by the market. So when there is no stakeholder pressure and you are appointing women into these senior roles, clearly you're doing it because you want to. You're doing it because you care about the problem. However, when you engage in those same behaviors in the presence of stakeholder pressures, you don't get nearly as many brownie points. Um, you're doing it now because you have to. Now, that's not a reason to stop doing things. Um, I would argue that this is actually a reason for you to step up your gender equity efforts in your organization. Because remember that stakeholder pressures creates a situation where most organizations are playing to the bottom. They're trying to not get caught at the bottom of the list. So you have a real opportunity to leapfrog in terms of reputation. Okay, so what's the moral of the story? I think the moral of the story is something like this. Um, historically, we have approached gender equity like we're tortoises, right? We've tried to run a very slow and very steady race. And we know the kinds of practices that are useful in that race. We know things like work flexibility will make a difference. But it's a really, really slow process. On the other hand, when we have external pressures, it forces us to think like hares. Uh, we really have to speed up the process. We generate boosts in gender equity, uh, but that's not very sustainable. So what's really going to win the race, I think, are the organizations that are somehow able to marry these two things. If you can respond to external pressures by embracing them, uh, by saying, here's really an opportunity for us to create a lot more gender diversity in the organization, recognizing that the increase in gender diversity is going to make your practices more effective and create a more sustainable system over the long run, that's when you're going to win the race. Thank you.